Truth Espresso, episode 277. Hello there, friends, family, foes, and lurkers alike. This is your host, Daniel Minnick, and my sweet, beautiful wife and co-host, Chelsea, is here with me once again for another episode of Truth Espresso. We're going to start a series talking about the infamous Jeffrey Epstein. And so, sweetheart, ready to talk about this uh, strange man and his life and aftermath. Yeah, this is some heavy information here, so we will just try it forward. Yeah, and so we'd like to give a disclaimer as you're listening to this episode. If you've never heard of Jeffrey Epstein, then you're going to learn a lot, but a lot of people have heard about Jeffrey Epstein, and be prepared that it's nearly impossible to talk about Jeffrey Epstein without talking about disturbing subject matter, and so that disclaimer is that we will be addressing some sensitive topics, but we will try our best to avoid being explicit as we give information about Epstein and his life and some of the bad things that he did, which ultimately resulted in criminal cases and even his own death in a jail cell. So Jeffrey Epstein, wealthy investor financier, philanthropist, mysterious, socialite, hung out with the celebrities, the stars, and shrouded in mystery. So all that describes the enigma that is Jeffrey Epstein. And for this episode, to start a series, we're going to talk about his early life and his influence before the next episode, getting into the legal issues, the cases that he found himself involved in. And I think when reading through a lot of this information about Jeffrey Epstein, the one verse that comes to mind constantly is really interesting that it's found in all three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the Synoptic Gospels for a reason. But it's just a good verse to keep in mind with all of this because, again, it is heavy information, but it's also information that we need to be aware of because we can protect our children, we can hopefully protect other people, and it just creates awareness of just the depth of sinful behavior. And this verse, the one I picked, was from Mark nine forty two, and it says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Hmm. And at that time, the sea was kind of the scary thing for people. It was almost like the ultimate death. They had no comprehension of the depth of the sea or if there were sea monsters. <laughs> I mean, there was just like general fear of the sea. So this was just kind of like you would rather face the ultimate fear, the ultimate death if you harmed these little ones. And this whole story about Jeffrey Epstein is about how he has offended these little ones yeah cause them to stumble because when you talk about abusing children abusing minors even when they're innocent and they're being affected by predators the tragedy of it can affect them for the rest of their lives it can affect in many cases the way they think their outlook on life and So it can affect their ability to be successful, their ability to understand truth and to be able to discern what's good and what's evil in some cases. So yes, Jesus had the point when he said offend or meaning to cause them to stumble. And so yes, children are fragile in that regard. And so it is important to protect children. And we have a society today that looks at children as their burdens or their tools, pawns for whatever people in power would like to do with them. And so, yeah, Jeffrey Epstein is definitely an example of that and an example of someone whom Jesus would have in mind when he'd say causing little ones to stumble. 
And some people might think, oh, that was just one person. He was this rich person who could have anything he wants. But this is something that's a reality with just everyday people too. With, I mean, reports of some of the illegal immigrants participating in a lot of human trafficking. And we have just so much evil with the trafficking industry right here in the United States. And it's this underground operation that's such a taboo subject. And I think we're starting to see a transition now where it's almost becoming something that's elevated, where some people are like, it's okay to love little kids and it's okay if you identify as a pedophile. Mm -hmm. And this is where we as Christians need to stand up for these innocent children We are not supposed to just sit back and say, oh, well, that's happening just on the island or, oh, this is something rare. No, it's happening every day within our community. So this is something that we need to be aware of and understand how some of this process works so we can stand up and protect these little kids. Epstein is not the end of this type of thing. He's a token of it. He's a symptom of a much larger or worldwide problem. And so, yes, I think the Epstein case ultimately is going to reveal a lot that people don't even know. And there's a lot of people who want to keep some of this stuff secret. But the more that comes out, the more that wakes people up, the more, I believe, can be exposed and possibly bring a lot of people with power and using it for secret things to bring to light. And I may not identify as a post-millennialist, but the post-millennialist will usually think that, hey, things could get better than they are now. And although not a post-millennialist, I do have some optimistic thoughts that there could be revivals that happen as a result of things going from bad to worse and it becomes so bad that it has to be dealt with and minds are awoken, awaken (laughs) to just how bad things are where they have to say, whoa, about face here. And yeah, so that's what we're going to see with Jeffrey Epstein. So how did all this kind of start with Jeffrey Epstein? Like, what was part of the influences that got him to where he was at? Yeah, and so we'll look at uh, Jeffrey Epstein's early life and his early career. And so he was, as a little kid, he was considered like kind of nerdy by some of his friends He was even a little pudgy, freckle-faced, pudgy, nerdy kid. And we know sometimes kids like that will end up showing the ones who make fun of them how they can turn out to be successful by some standard, become great. But in Epstein's case, his greatness was, you know, not too great. And so in his early career, the first known job that we have is that he taught calculus and physics from 1974 to 1976 at the Dalton School in Manhattan. The Dalton School is kind of a prestigious K-12 through school. But we see that reports from even some of the students there show that Epstein's affinities were early on and so as he was a school teacher there teaching math some of the students have testified that he hung around with and he flirted with female students during that time and of course these would be minors so he seemed to have that propensity even as a young man teaching math Now, he didn't have a college degree, but he was smart in that regard, so he was able to teach advanced math not having a degree in it. Now, Epstein met Alan Greenberg, who is the CEO of Bear Stearns, the large investment firm, because Mr. Greenberg had some children attending Dalton. And so when Epstein was fired after two years of teaching math at Dalton for 
poor performance, as was said, Greenberg gave him a job at Bear Stearns. And so that started Epstein's work in investment. And since he was good with numbers and math, he would naturally, by learning finances, become good with finances. So in the 1980s, Epstein started his financial work at Bear Stearns and he worked his way up to being a a limited partner. So being a limited partner at Bear Stearns was a pretty high profile position there. Epstein also seemed to learn how to be a shrewd and flamboyant (laughs) investor in a way. Because then after he left Bear Stearns, he then worked for Towers Financial Corporation that ultimately ended up going bankrupt for running a large Ponzi scheme with its investors. And that seems also to clue us in on the way Epstein would think of finances, that he would use them like this company here for his gain and possibly at the expense of investors. After Epstein left Towers Financial Corporation not too long before it went bankrupt, he started his own company called J. Epstein & Company in 1988. Later on, he renamed it Financial Trust Company. That sounds like a pretty generic name to me there. So Epstein's investment firm, which managed billions of dollars, It seemed to focus heavily on managing the assets of billionaire Leslie Wexner, who's the owner of the CEO of L Brands and Victoria's Secret. Epstein obviously made a high-profile friend there, and he started his own company to manage this guy's assets. And so, hey, Epstein is this amazing, wealthy owner of an investment firm, but... Supposedly, he earned his fortune by managing and investing the fortunes of billionaires, and he'd make all his money by the fees that he would charge for the accounts, but he kept his client list confidential. Anytime a a reporter would ask him about it, he would say it's confidential, but eventually one client was confirmed, and that was Wexner. So it's possible that his business was kind of almost a shell company for just managing the money from the owner of Victoria's Secret. So a lot of his business dealings were definitely on the sketchy side. In an article by Business Insider, we see that reporter Taylor Nicole Rogers says, quote, Jeffrey Epstein made $200 million in five years after he registered as a sex offender. And that was about 2008 when he was registered for that. Here's how the mysterious financer made his fortune, unquote. So we'll provide a link to that article in the show notes. And that's talking about how he made his money through Wexner there. And so, sweetheart, one of Epstein's most famous houses or dwelling places that he lived in is actually the most expensive place in New York, basically, a residential place. Yes, so his sketchy business dealings continues. Wexner, who he was helping invest, owned what is now the $77 million Herbert N. Strauss house. It's a nine-floor, 51,000-square-foot townhouse in Manhattan. Epstein started residing in it in 1996, but he was not legally the owner In 2011, Epstein signed a property transfer document to give him ownership of it for zero dollars. Records are murky as to when and how he was legally the owner before this. So it just sounds like he kind of assigned himself this (laughs) very luxurious townhouse here. As I was trying to research that out, like the articles would say, like, it's not unusual for these zero dollar transfer sales it's usually like an accounting thing if you're the buyer and the seller of it and you're trying to transfer an asset to a different company or something but yeah as you mentioned sweetheart is like it's murky about when did he have the ownership so that he could 
sell it to himself, zero dollars, such that he's transferring the management or ownership from one of his companies to another. It seemed that Wexner was letting him live in this townhouse before, like almost kind of like a quid pro quo. Hey, if you're managing my money, here, live in this fancy house that I own. And he probably wasn't even paying rent or anything. It's just a shady gift to him. And then eventually it's like, okay, so when did Wexner actually turn over ownership to Epstein? And probably there is some kind of partnership that they both had together together on stuff where it's kind of eventually like yeah he owns it now he might as well and let's try to finally make it legal and official at some point here i was reading that my first impression was yikes did he do this like without wexner's knowledge i mean you'd think there would be a lawsuit if that was the case but yeah definitely sketchy business dealings there Yeah, we'll have another link for that by Libertina Brandt entitled, Here's How Jeffrey Epstein May Have Acquired a $77 Million Upper East Side Townhouse for $0, also from Business Insider that gives more information about Epstein and the legal sale of this house to himself, basically. Ever wish you could get together with a friend over coffee each week and talk about God's Word? Me too. Hi. I'm Anthony Russo. I'm the host of Grace and Peace Radio. Grace and Peace Radio is a Christian living blog and podcast dedicated to engaging conversations about applying God's Word to everyday life. I hope you'll join me, Anthony Russo, on Grace and Peace Radio each week at graceandpeaceradio.com or right here on the Christian Podcast Community.org. Having the most fancy townhouse in New York which is one of the most fancy, or at least used to be, one of the most fancy places in the world. So basically, I think, really, this particular townhouse per square foot is like the most expensive area in the world, basically. So Epstein, when it comes to like a residential townhouse, it was the most expensive dwelling place in the world, basically. But that's not the only place that Epstein owned. As if you know about Epstein, you've probably heard of an island that he owned, and Epstein owned several homes. However, most of Epstein's wealth was not tied up in just that townhouse there. It was on St. Thomas, which was one of the U.S. Virgin Islands in the Caribbean. He shifted most of his investment firm operations there in 1998 because the Virgin Islands, not being a state of the United States, but a protectorate, it was more of a tax shelter that he could do his investment operations and not have to pay the taxes that he would if it was headquartered in New York. Epstein also bought the whole island of Little St. James in 1998 for just under $8 million at the time. This island of Little St. James would become the headquarters of his trafficking operation where he would traffic minor girls. Epstein also bought homes elsewhere, including Paris, France, Palm Beach, Florida, and Miami, Florida. I know he also had a house in New Mexico. Wow, we're up to like six houses at this (laughs) point. My goodness. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's a lot to take care of one house. So Epstein was a very wealthy man. Now, he never showed up on the Forbes top billionaires list because Epstein was never listed as a billionaire. And that's really because Epstein never fully disclosed to the government what exactly his entire net worth was. So In a future episode, we'll talk about the cases he was involved in, and in some cases, Epstein would have to submit some statements talking about some of his wealth, and we know that it was in the hundreds of millions, but there's speculation that he had more than that. He was probably a billionaire, but for tax purposes, for just having to hide certain activities that money would be tied to, I'm sure he had a lot of money that wasn't reported on to cover his tracks in some of his operations. So you think his just pursuance of, is that a word? (laughs) Pursuit of? Yes, 
pursuit of money, it reminds me of that verse, 1 Timothy 6.10, where it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Like he was like so obsessed with more and more and more, like never having enough. Like he needed this house and this one and the most expensive one. And now he needs his own island and just that pursuit and making money this idol in his life. You see just how much evil is kind of brewing from that. It didn't matter if it was having a operation that was harming young girls or doing things that he should be arrested for at that point. He was just so focused on having more and having the most. Yeah, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And I know that you can understand the verse saying, it's the root of all types of evil. The love of money is the root of all these different things that people can do with as evil. It's It can cause all different types of evil, including like, hey, you have lots of money. You can use that to control people and you can use that for your own appetites, which we learned that Epstein had an incredibly insatiable appetite for trafficking minor girls. As we go through the cases in another episode, we will see that even a judge later on, not long before Epstein died, pointed that out. Just how like uncontrollable it was for him that he couldn't grant a request for bail because of that. And so the love of money is definitely the root of all kinds of evil. What kind of influence did Epstein have? I mean, as a wealthy man, and it seems that Epstein managed to get his wealth by who he knew, who he met. The CEO of Bear Stearns, the CEO of Victoria's Secret. He just happened, it seems, to have met very wealthy people in finance. And so Epstein just, some people are math geniuses. Epstein was a math genius who met people with lots of money. And so that gave him the opportunity to build up all kinds of wealth for himself. Epstein's business and social life still is shrouded in mystery. So, yeah, as we learn about Jeffrey Epstein, I'm sure the world's going to learn more about him as time goes on, possibly even more this year. We're doing these episodes kind of as a result of the documents that were released. There were, I think, four batches of documents that were unsealed. And we're going to talk about the case in which they were unsealed. And we have the episode on the cases. But there's so much mystery surrounding Jeffrey Epstein. You know, who knows? We may never know about all the meaty details of his life. And I'm sure that, of course, that was intentional on his part. He wanted people to get to know him according to the persona that he wanted them to see and not according to all kinds of financial and criminal things that he was trying to keep secret and only use to control people as he deemed fit. Also, like another part of what kind of made us start to look into this case too, yeah, there's stuff coming out, but then when we were looking at like last week's episode, we were talking about redaction and how people use redaction to cover things up so there isn't their misdealings or their sin, if you say, revealed to everyone. And Epstein's definitely an example of a cover up and trying to hide, trying to have all this mystery of what actually went on. On. And sometimes it just makes your heart kind of sad because now he's deceased and he's going to face the ultimate and just God who's going to expose all those hidden secrets, all those mystery things, all those things that he thought he could keep under wraps. That's going to be exposed and he's going to face the wrath of God, which is even more scary than any wrath that he ever faced on this earth. Mm. And it just makes you like, even how horrible and how destructive he was, he could have repented and God would have forgiven him. Like, wow, how great is God's grace and mercy when he can forgive someone as evil as Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. Like that's just beyond my comprehension. 
like okay thankfully that is not my job because I don't think I could ever do that but our God is great in mercy and he wanted Jeffrey Epstein to come to him and to repent and turn from his ways And unfortunately, when we look at his life, it seems like he was determined to stay on this path of destruction and harm and just living that sinful life, selfish life for him. So yes, eventually your sin will find you out. And that's kind of what we're seeing with him too, even though there's all this mystery and stuff that's unknown, more of it's getting revealed, like you said, and ultimately God will reveal all that he has done. Amen. So we are. Yeah. It's good to remind ourselves of that because if we didn't believe in God and didn't believe in the gospel and the truth of the Bible, you know, we'd have to look at all this and just think like, oh, it's so depressing. All these people with power, they get away with stuff. Or even if they don't, they leave absolute destruction in their wake and there's just no hope. The people with the money and the power, they're always going to succeed in controlling everything. And that's why we have the hope that the Bible gives us and the gospel gives us because we see closure, we see perfect justice. And the wicked will, if they're not repented and believe the gospel, they will face the ultimate justice. So who are some of the kind of more well-known names that he got to meet along his path? Yeah, so if you were someone of renown, if you were a high politician, a king, a prince, a well-known actor, at some point in your life, you were bound to meet Jeffrey Epstein. So some examples from real estate mogul Donald Trump to President Bill Clinton to Prince Andrew, to entrepreneurs Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, to actors Kevin Spacey and Chris Tucker, to magician David Copperfield. If you had any notoriety, if you had any power, if you were wealthy or famous, you were bound to meet Jeffrey Epstein at some event, especially in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Little did many of these high-profile friends of Epstein know at their first encounter that they were hanging out with the most scandalous trafficker in modern history. All they thought when they first meet him is, wow, he's this amiable, fun socialite. And I'm sure he didn't just reveal the depths of his depravity to people for quite a while. So you heard a bunch of names that you'd probably recognize... Just someone who even hung out with him at some point that doesn't necessarily incriminate that person. As the names are being released from the documents, just because a name is there, just because the person met or knew Epstein, doesn't mean that that person in particular did anything wrong. Now, some of the names of people, they were a little close to him, and they did know about stuff. Some of them did do stuff wrong, but other people... They didn't know about things, and then maybe once they did, they broke ties with him, or they had to do it silently, whatever. Doesn't this remind you of so many verses in scripture where it's talking about the cunningness, the subtleness, the just kind of sly, slick evil of the serpent? In that they sound nice, it sounds promising, it sounds amazing, but they're deceiving people. It was like the great deceiver, Satan himself, was even like a beautiful angel that was cast out of heaven. And so beauty is, is yeah, deceitful. deceitful. Yeah. So it's like people that are suave and sound nice and sound like they would be an amazing friend or a great partner to bring on and someone you could trust. It's kind of scary sometimes. You're like, hey, why are people that act like that and can truly act like someone other than who they really are? It's just such a depth to that evilness. It's hard to even think about. Obviously, some people like Epstein are able to keep things secret for a while so he can make many friends and probably many of them had no idea for years what really was going on. 
one of the episodes in the series are going to talk about theories about Epstein. Like, was he an international spy? Was he involved in intelligence? And there's a lot of evidence that he was. And so, yeah, some of the friends that he would meet, you know, we might find out that he would find a way to honeypot, trap them when they got close enough to him. And then it's like, now that you really know him, you don't tell anyone. And he would probably threaten like, hey, I know the top, I have an army of lawyers. So even if you think you're going to do the virtuous thing and tattle on me, I'm going to destroy your life in court and make sure that no one's going to believe you either. So just don't even think about it. There's no possible way you can fight this. Don't be a hero type of thing. So yeah, we'll talk about that theory in an episode in the series. Parenting isn't about us. In fact, parenting isn't even about our kids. Parenting is just one way Christian dads and moms are to worship God. So welcome to the Truth Love Parent Podcast, where we train dads and moms to give God the preeminence in their parenting. I'm your host, A.M. Brewster, and today we bring our biblical parenting essentials. If you've ever wanted to have me visit your local church, or your school, camp, some ministry of some kind, or home even, to speak on how God would have us to parent our kids or any other family topics, please visit truthloveparent.com and click on the speaking tab. And please, of course, share this whole series on your favorite social media outlets so that other Christian parents can mature in their parenting. Subscribe to the show and follow it for weekly encouragement. And if you and or your family need some specialized and individualized help, please write to us at counselor at truthloveparent.com or leave a voicemail at 828 828- 423-0894. Listen, I love you more than you realize. I love your family equally, and I'm honored to be invited to serve you at this important time in your life. So Lord willing, I'll see you soon. Truth Love Parent is part of the Evermind Ministries family and is dedicated to helping you worship God through your parenting. So join us next time as we study God's Word to learn how to parent our children for life and godliness. And remember that TLP is a listener-supported ministry. You can visit truthloveparent.com forward slash donate to learn more. Now, like almost anyone with money and power, they're going to often be involved in philanthropy. I mean, think of Bill Clinton, you have the Clinton Foundation. (laughs) You have Bill Gates, you have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, stuff like that. A lot of people who make a lot of money start some kind of philanthropy organization and they give, you know, millions of dollars to different causes. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good, (laughs) you know, because when we think of Bill Gates, I'm sure he's given some money that had good uses, but he'd also use it for things to control the world in the way he thinks things should be done. And Clinton Foundation has been involved in a lot of scandals and stuff. So Epstein also seemed to be a philanthropist, and he'd give money to institutions of higher learning, but especially Harvard. So I think in the course of about a decade, he gave a total of $9 million to Harvard before his first criminal conviction in 2008, which we'll talk about in the next episode. But why did he give all that money to Harvard? Well, there's reports, there's people who knew him that would explain that he also had a lot of friends, like professors and administrators at Harvard. And so perhaps there is a lot of money there for reasons that Epstein had that weren't necessarily just goodwilled. So I'll have a link to an article about Epstein's Harvard friends in the show notes from the Daily Beast. So Epstein had two criminal convictions, one in 2008 and then the big one in 2019. And since that conviction happened, Harvard had about $200,000 remaining of the balance that Epstein had given them. And so Harvard said that they would donate the remaining $200,000 to nonprofit groups supporting victims of trafficking. So if we were to take Harvard at their word, that would be a good use of that. 
So speaking of good nonprofit groups that are really trying to help and support human trafficking victims, I know Tim Tebow and his wife have a human trafficking foundation and ways that they try and help kids get out of that and help them heal and help them to be able to live life again. Unfortunately, a lot of these kids have a hard time after this. So it's really neat to see that there are different people out there trying to create a safe place and help these poor kids that are in these situations. So that would be a good use of money from some of those billionaires, but I'm pretty sure the Clintons and Bill Gates do not support human trafficking causes. Yeah, and now with all the recent scandals with Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard who had to resign, and you had the one from University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, all the woke stuff, all the institutions of higher learning, like, you know, maybe you should think twice before donating money to these big universities that also get federal grants and seem to have lots of money to hire all kinds of diversity administrators administrators and able to still hike up tuition rates while administrators are making bank and they're focusing so much on politically correct policies and if you're going to be a philanthropist and you have some money how about not giving it to these big universities like Harvard so among Epstein's influence and his philanthropy was his idea of eugenics. And so, yeah, we thought eugenics was kind of a thing of the past, a throwback to about 100 years ago. But Epstein had his own unique brand of eugenics. He had an extreme ego with his idea of how to be the ultimate philanthropist because it was about him. He wanted a eugenic scheme by which he would spread his DNA across the world. That would be his greatest gift to the world, his own DNA. And how would that be? Well, through offspring, you know, if he were to have children... And he had this elaborate scheme by which he wanted to impregnate 20 women at once in his New Mexico residence. So it'd be a kind of a baby compound. And so he wanted to have a lot of children through a lot of women. And <laughs> yeah, this guy really was conceited in more ways than one. But, of course, as we're going to get into a lot of his trafficking scandals, of course, you know, he had a lot of, shall we say, partners from these scandals. And ultimately, through it all, somehow, at least there's nothing on record about Epstein having any children. And so it doesn't seem that he would be involved in the lives of his Given his character with all that, his philanthropic eugenic scheme to have children with 20 women to spread his blessed DNA all over the world and his lifestyle, we know that it doesn't seem that Epstein would have intended to be a father figure to these children of 20 women. But obviously that, as far as we know, never happened. That was just a pipe dream in his mind. So it is interesting that they have, since Epstein's death, there have been quite a few, over a hundred women actually, that have come forward and said that they are heirs, like they are his children. Hmm. So they have set up a DNA kind of testing center to try and verify if these are indeed heirs or not. So oh, okay. So yeah. there are potential yeah. <laughs> people. As we said, there's a lot that's going to come out about this uh, late Jeffrey Epstein character. And yeah. yeah, if he does have DNA through children, it would be great if the legacy that he leaves will be people who will reject what Jeffrey Epstein did and will make his legacy of, yeah, he was a bad dude, but we're all going to do the right thing and we're all going to be our own blessing to the world in spite of what he has done. It just seems kind of odd because I mean, even the article I was reading it, it was like he's been promiscuous for so long oh, yeah. that you would Several think decades, yes. that they're like, he could even have grandchildren at this point mm. <laughs> because there's been such a long history of him being inappropriate with women and stuff. So it just seems like it'd be 
the probability of him impregnating someone, it seems very high. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what all starts to come out. And I mean, it is a sad thing to think about this really happened. This went on. It's still going on. Even though Epstein is dead, there are other people and other people that aren't billionaires and well-known. They may never even be investigated because of that. There's such an underground system with this. It's just sickening to think about this. And again, we as Christians are called to stand up for these children, the children that are innocent, that potentially are fatherless and just protecting them. So. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we will pick up our discussion of Jeffrey Epstein in the next episode as we look at how he was mired in legal issues starting from the mid-2000s and ultimately he could not completely cover his tracks until 2019 and lots of sealed stuff becoming unsealed and I think it's only a matter of time before the dominoes really start to fall and a lot of stuff really starts to get revealed that cannot be held back. And so, yeah, stay tuned for all that and um, stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso as we cover more Jeffrey Epstein and God bless. Mm-hmm.